Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video about major updates to cases we've already covered on the channel. On our other channel, Paranormally Listed, we cover topics like ghosts, UFOs, and cryptids. We understand that some of you may not like the channel because you don't believe in those topics. If that's the case, we have a new video that you may really enjoy. It's called Three Paranormal Hoax. We talk about three famous cases of paranormal activity that were later determined to be hoaxes. Here's a short clip. In paranormal circles, it's called the Surgeon's Photo. A purported snapshot of the Loch Ness Monster. Taken in 1934, the photo was front page news around the world. It was considered by many as proof the monster existed in the murky depths of that famous Scottish lake. To some, it looked like a long-necked dinosaur, perhaps a plesiosaur. After all, they thought, alligators and crocodiles were relics from the age of dinosaurs. Why not a swimming dinosaur too? For decades, this one photo has captured the imagination of millions. Until 1993, when the people responsible for the photo admitted it was a hoax. But the hoax wasn't created to pull a fast one on an unsuspecting public. It was created as revenge. We'll have a link to the rest of the video at the end of this video. Also, please subscribe to the channel because we'll be putting out videos regularly. We'll also be uploading videos regularly to this channel. And I have to say, it's nice to be back to work after the holidays. Ugh, I'm certainly happy that the holidays are over. Many people love Christmas and New Year's, but I usually find that week and the lead up to it emotionally exhausting. I used to find all that socializing and forced, mostly fake, happiness got to be too much. But this year was much better though because I've been talking to my BetterHelp therapist. BetterHelp is the sponsor of today's video. As a result, I actually really enjoyed this holiday season. That's because my therapist gave me exercises on how to calm myself down if I got too anxious. Do you find it difficult to get through the holidays? Or do you want to improve your mental health in 2023? Then you should check out BetterHelp for yourself. That's better, H-E-L-P. We want to say a big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. BetterHelp has a network of 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists, so they have experts who can help you in a wide array of areas. When you sign up for BetterHelp, you answer a few questions about your needs and preferences so they match you with the right therapist. Then it's up to you regarding how you talk with them, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions. But what happens if you're set up with a therapist you don't feel is right? The good news is you can switch therapists at no additional charge. Also, with BetterHelp, you can expect the same professionalism and quality that you would with in-office therapy, but you get more flexibility with scheduling, your therapist is custom picked for you, and it's more affordable. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash listed. And I've also linked them below in the description or scan the QR code. Number 3. Annette K. Schnee and Barbara Jo Oberholzer In the video, Three Unsolved Mysteries with Mysterious Photos Part 2, we covered the murders of Annette K. Schnee and Barbara Jo Oberholzer, who went by the name Bobby Joe. At the start of 1982, Jeff and Bobby Joe Oberholzer lived in the small town of Alma, Colorado. Jeff ran an appliance repair shop in town. Bobby Joe worked in a real estate office in a strip mall in the nearby town of Breckenridge. On January 6, 1982, 29-year-old Bobby Joe was promoted to office manager. After work, Bobby Joe called Jeff and told him that she and some co-workers were going to a bar in the strip mall to celebrate. She was going to have a few drinks and then head home. Jeff offered to pick her up, but Bobby Joe said she would hitchhike home. Bobby Joe had a few drinks and then left the bar alone at 7.45 p.m. Her co-workers saw her at the road hitchhiking south towards Alma. Meanwhile, Jeff was at home. He had made dinner, but then fell asleep while waiting for Bobby Joe. He woke up around midnight and realized Bobby Joe wasn't there. He thought she was still at the bar. But as 2 a.m. rolled around, he became worried because the bar was closed and she should have been home by then. So he started calling her co-workers. They told him they last saw her hitchhiking at about 7.45 p.m. outside the bar. 
Jeff immediately tried to report Bobby Joe missing, but he was told it was too early. Around 3 o'clock the next afternoon, a person who had been cross-country skiing near Hoosers Pass called the police. Hoosers Pass is a high mountain pass that connects Breckenridge, where Bobby Joe was last seen, and Alma, where Bobby Joe lived. The skier found a woman's body near the summit's parking lot. It was the body of 29-year-old Bobby Joe Oberholzer. Based on the evidence, the police theorized that the killer picked up Bobby Joe and started driving in the direction of her home. He then pulled into the parking lot of the summit and tried to bind her with plastic zip ties. However, Bobby Joe put up a fight. It's believed that she struck his nose and the blow caused him to bleed. She managed to get out of his vehicle and started running downhill. But then, for some reason, after she got about 300 yards, she started to backtrack. She was then shot twice while the killer stood about two or three feet away from her. One bullet entered her chest and the other grazed her right breast. The medical examiner believed she either bled or froze to death. Not far from Bobby Joe's body, the police found a backpack and a single orange sock. Neither item belonged to Bobby Joe. A few hours after Bobby Joe's body was found, 21-year-old Annette Schnee was reported missing. Schnee lived in Blue Ridge, Colorado with five roommates. She had two jobs. One was cleaning rooms at a Holiday Inn in Frisco, Colorado. She also worked as a waitress at a country western bar in Breckenridge. The police tracked her last movements and learned she had gone missing from Breckenridge. In fact, she went missing just a few hours before Bobby Joe went missing. On January 6, Annette started her shift at the Holiday Inn. However, she wasn't feeling well, so she left early and went to the doctor's office. She then hitchhiked to Breckenridge to fill a prescription. She then planned on hitchhiking back home to Blue Ridge, where she would pick up her uniform. She would then hitchhike to Breckenridge for her 8 p.m. shift at the bar. She was last seen at 4.45 p.m. in Breckenridge. She never made it home to get her uniform, and she didn't show up for work. The investigators immediately believed Bobby Joe's murder and Annette's disappearance were connected. Both were blonde, white women who were 5'3 and weighed 100 pounds. Also, they went missing within hours of each other while they were both hitchhiking in the same small town. Six months went by. On July 3, 1982, a boy was fishing in a stream about 23 miles away from where Annette was last seen and 60 miles from where Bobby Joe was murdered. He found a body floating in the stream. It turned out to be the body of 21-year-old Annette Schnee. The medical examiner believed she had been raped. She was then shot in the back as she ran downhill towards the stream. One major thing the police noted was that Annette was only wearing one orange sock. The matching sock was found near Bobby Joe's body. It was also determined that the backpack found close to Bobby Joe's body belonged to Annette. Based on the new evidence, the police expanded their theory about what happened that night. First, the killer picked up Annette while she was hitchhiking. He took her to a secluded area near Sacramento Creek where he sexually assaulted her. Annette dressed quickly and only put on one orange sock and then her boots. She then tried to run away from her attacker, but she was shot in the lower back as she ran. After raping and murdering Annette, the killer drove back to Breckenridge. He picked up Bobby Joe as she was hitchhiking. While Bobby Joe was trying to escape, she probably knocked the orange sock and backpack out of the killer's vehicle. The police had a suspect, and that was Bobby Joe's husband, Jeff Oberholzer. It turned out that Jeff had met Annette before, but he initially told the police that he didn't know her. A few months before her murder, he had picked her up while she was hitchhiking. As he drove her, she talked about an appliance that she needed to get fixed. So Jeff gave her her business card. The police found Jeff's business card in Annette's wallet. 
Jeff claimed he never saw or heard from her after that. Then, Jeff handed over two pieces of incriminating evidence. Jeff said on the same day that Bobby Joe's body was found, he was driving on a highway several miles away from where her body was found. He noticed something unusual on the side of the road, so he pulled over. It happened to be Bobby Joe's right glove and a tissue. They both had blood on them. The police thought that this was all too much and that it couldn't be all a coincidence. So they had Jeff do a polygraph exam. He denied committing both murders. He passed the polygraph exam. Despite passing the polygraph exam, the police still suspected they had killed the two women. However, they couldn't find any evidence to charge him with anything. Over the years, the police had other suspects, including two serial killers. But no charges were laid in the ensuing decades. In 1998, the police created a DNA profile of the killer. The first person they compared the DNA to was Jeff Oberholzer. His DNA did not match. The police were also able to confirm they had an alibi for the time of the murders. The DNA also didn't belong to either serial killer. Also, we initially said we covered these two cases in a video called Three Unsolved Mysteries with Mysterious Photos Part 2. That's because the police thought that one possible clue was a photograph of a man found in Annette's backpack. The photo is on the screen now. However, the photo did not lead the police to any suspects. In 2018, the case file was given to a former prosecutor and the founder of a forensic genealogy company. The company worked on the case for a couple years. Then they identified a suspect, 71-year-old Alan Lee Phillips. Thanks to newspaper records, the investigators were even able to link Phillips to the crime scene. In 1982, when the murders were committed, Phillips was 30 years old and lived in Georgetown, Colorado. On the night of the murders, his truck became stuck in a snowdrift on Guanella Pass. If someone were driving south on Hoosers Pass, where Bobby Joe's body was found, if they continued south after the pass and started heading north on Fair Play towards Georgetown, they would drive on Guanella Pass. When Phillips became stuck, he started flashing SOS Morse code with his headlights. A man flying on a plane overhead happened to be a sheriff and recognized the message. He told the pilot and the pilot called for help, which led to Phillips being saved. The newspaper quoted Phillips as saying, you find out how lonely it is really quick. Little did anyone know, but Phillips said this after shooting two women as they ran away from him in fear of their own lives. After Phillips' DNA was linked to Bobby Joe's murder, the police started a five-week surveillance of the 71-year-old man. He had been living in Dumont, Colorado for the past four decades. He worked as a miner and a mechanic. In 2021, he was a semi-retired mechanic. On February 24, 2021, nearly 39 years after the murder, Phillips was arrested. He went to trial in September 2022. The trial lasted two and a half weeks. The jury deliberated for around five hours. Alan Phillips was found guilty of both murders. In November 2022, he was sentenced to life with the chance of parole. He'll be able to apply for parole in December 2062. It's doubtful he'll make it to his parole hearing because he'll be 131 years old in December 2062. Alan Phillips is currently serving a sentence at the Arkansas Valley Correctional Facility in Ordway, Colorado. Number 2. Melissa Highsmith In a video from our first year, Five Unsolved Babysitter Mysteries, we discuss the case of Melissa Highsmith. In the summer of 1971, Alta Highsmith was a 22-year-old single mother. She had a 21-month-old daughter, Melissa Highsmith. Alta and Melissa lived in an apartment in Fort Worth, Texas with a roommate. 
Since Alta was single, she needed to work to support them. She got a job at a restaurant. Alta put a classified ad in the newspaper, looking for a babysitter. On August 18, 1971, a woman who identified herself as Ruth Johnson called Elta. She said she would like to babysit Melissa. She said she had three kids of her own. She had a house with a big backyard with a gym set and a swing set. Alta said that sounded great and asked Ruth Johnson to come by her restaurant for a short interview. However, Johnson didn't show up. But she called Alta at home again and explained she really wanted the job. Alta thought that the woman seemed trustworthy. Also, she was desperate. She was worried that she'd be fired if she didn't get a babysitter soon. So Alta agreed to let Ruth Johnson babysit Melissa. On the morning of August 23rd, 1971, Alta went to work. She left Melissa at home with her roommate. At about 7.30 a.m., a woman came to the apartment dressed in nice clothes and white gloves. The roommate handed Melissa over, plus a dress, sandals, and a few diapers for the day. The babysitter was supposed to bring Melissa home between 3 and 4 p.m., but she didn't return with the baby. At 8 p.m., the police were called. The police surmised that the woman's real name was not Ruth Johnson but they had no idea what her real identity was. The FBI was called in, but they didn't make much progress on the case. The authorities thought that the woman wanted a child of her own, but for whatever reason, she couldn't have one. So she kidnapped Melissa to raise as her own child. Melissa's family was also hoping that was what happened because it meant she was still alive. Melissa's mother, Alta, and her father, Jeffrey Highsmith, went on to have more children with other partners. Their families searched for Melissa for years. They traveled to different states to track down leads. They also posted on forums like web sleuths. Also, for decades, suspicion hung over Alta. The police thought that she had killed Melissa and they made up the story about the kidnapping to cover it up. But Alta and her family knew she didn't harm Melissa. So they continued to throw birthdays for her every November. That's what they did on November 6, 2022. It was Melissa's 53rd birthday and it had been 51 years since she had been kidnapped. That day, Jeffrey got his results for the Ancestry database 23andMe. He discovered he had a granddaughter he didn't know about. The family was then put in contact with an amateur genealogist. She was able to identify the parents of the granddaughter, Melanie and John Brown. The genealogist found John and Melanie's marriage certificate. Using that, Melissa's two sisters found the Facebook profile of a woman named Melody Walden, who they believed was really Melissa. Melanie had lived in Fort Worth her entire life. They sent Melanie a Facebook message. Initially, Melanie didn't believe them. She thought that they were trying to scam her. She said she would pray for them. But Melanie became curious, so she started reading about the kidnapping. Something caught her attention. The article said that Melissa had a birthmark on her back. She also had a birthmark on her back. Her husband examined the photos of baby Melissa and he saw similarities. So Melanie contacted the woman who raised her. The woman, who has never been identified, admitted that she wasn't her biological mother. She said that she had paid $500 for her in 1972. For Melanie, this confirmed that she was really Melissa. She contacted her sisters and set up a meeting with her biological parents. On the weekend after Thanksgiving 2022, 51 years after she went missing, Melissa met her parents and two of her four siblings. Melanie said she would start going by her birth name, Melissa. Melissa said that she had grown up in the Fort Worth area. 
She said that her early life was miserable. She said that she never felt love growing up. She was never allowed to go outside or play. The woman who raised her said it was because she was born at home and had brain damage. Melissa ended up running away from home when she was 15. She ended up living and working on the streets. She had married several times and had three children. When she learned she had been kidnapped, she was cleaning houses in her church. Melissa said she was looking forward to getting to know her biological family. Melissa also said that she does not believe that the woman who raised her paid money for her. Instead, she believes she was the woman who kidnapped her. The statute of limitations on the kidnapping charges ran out 20 years after Melissa's 18th birthday, so the woman can't be charged with kidnapping. However, the police said that they are still investigating. Number 1. Susan Eads and Lisa Jackson One of our longest videos is Two Creepy Unsolved Mysteries with Mysterious Phone Calls Part 5. In that video, we cover the Texas Killing Fields, which is an oil field south of Houston. Since 1971, dozens of women have either been killed there or their bodies have been dumped there. In the video, we cover 38 unsolved murders of women and girls. Since that video went live four and a half years ago, two of the murders have been solved. One of those murders was that of 19-year-old Susan Eads. In August 1983, she was waitressing at two bars. Also, when she could find the work, she would DJ. On August 30th, 1983, Susan was working at a bar in Webster, Texas. At the end of her shift, she left the bar alone. Tragically, she never made it home. Her dead body was found in a bush in an empty lot not far from the bar. Her body was not found at the Texas Killing Field. Instead, it was found about 10 miles from the field. However, her body was often associated with the Killing Field based on its proximity. The police interviewed people who were at the bar that night. Several people said a man had asked her to dance, but she turned him down. No one at the bar that night knew who the man was, but some of them were able to describe the man which resulted in this composite image. He had a dark handlebar mustache and he was wearing a dark cowboy hat. However, the image did not lead to any arrest. Shortly after the murder, Susan's mother, Shirley, started to receive unusual phone calls. Initially, the caller would just hang up. But then, the caller started talking. He said his name was Bill and he lived on Telephone Road. Telephone Road is in eastern and southeastern Houston. Shirley contacted the police and they tried to trace the calls. But the caller never stayed on long enough for them to trace the calls. The call stopped about a year after the murder. Decades later, in 2017, the police reopened the case. In 2018, the police made some of the recordings of the calls public. However, it did not lead to an arrest. Also in 2018, they started examining other evidence. This included Susan's clothes. Male DNA was found on it, but it did not match anyone in any of the databases. The police even postponed the execution of a serial killer named Anthony Allen Shore to check to see if he killed Susan Deeds. But he was cleared as a suspect and executed on January 18, 2018. The local police then gave the DNA profile to the FBI who worked with a geneticist on the case. They found a relative of the killer who cooperated with them. Thanks to their cooperation, they were able to identify the killer. In June 2020, 37 years after the murder, the police announced the case was closed. 35-year-old Arthur Raymond Davis had murdered Susan Eads. What struck the police was that Davis looked remarkably like the man in the composite image. They even found a photo of Davis wearing a hat that looks exactly like the hat in the image. 
Not a lot is known about Arthur Davis. He had served in Vietnam and he had worked as a seaboat captain. On January 16, 1984, about six months after Susan Eads was murdered, 35-year-old Arthur Davis was killed in a car accident. The accident happened about a mile away from where he murdered Susan. Dennis Eads, Susan's brother, was happy that after 37 years, the case was finally solved. But he thinks it's unfortunate that Davis never faced justice for what he did. Dennis called it both an amazing victory and a hollow victory. The police said they are still investigating Davis to see if they can connect him to any of the other killing field murders. But in the two and a half years since he was identified as Susan Eads' killer, no further announcements have been made. Also, since Davis died six months after the murder, he could have been the man who called himself Bill, who harassed Susan's mother, Shirley. The police now know for sure that it was just a disturbing prank. But the caller's identity remains a mystery. As we mentioned, the police solved another murder associated with the killing fields. This one was committed about five years before Susan Eads was killed. On September 7, 1979, 12-year-old Lisa Michelle Jackson went swimming with her brothers at a local pool in Conroe, Texas. She decided to walk home alone. Tragically, she never made it home. Six days later, her dead body was found in the oil field, about 17 miles away from where she was last seen. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Unfortunately, not much progress was made on the case. In the years after the murder, Lisa's mother and brothers moved away from Texas. They eventually forgave the killer, even though they didn't know his identity. One of her brothers said that forgiving him was the only way they could go on living. Then in October 2021, the evidence was examined using an MVAC. We talk about the MVAC in episode 36 of her podcast, Into the Killing. The MVAC was developed by Dr. Bruce Bradley, a microbiologist, in 2002. It was initially created to suck bacteria off food. It also preserves collected pathogens in a liquid to be used in lab analysis. It became a forensic tool after Dr. Bradley's son described it to his friend, who was an FBI agent. The FBI agent saw the potential when it came to collecting forensic evidence. It turned out that compared to traditional cotton swab, the MVAC collects 40% more DNA from polyester and 88% more from a blood stain on nylon fabric. When the MVAC was used on DNA from Lisa's case, DNA from an unknown male was found. In April 2022, the DNA profile was run through the combined DNA index system, also known as CODIS. A match was found. The DNA belonged to a man named Gerald Dwight Casey. On July 10, 1989, 34-year-old Casey and his girlfriend, Carla Smith, went to the home of an acquaintance to steal some guns so they could sell them. The friend wasn't home then, but his girlfriend, 29-year-old Sonia Lynn Howell, was there. Howell tried to stop Smith and Casey by calling the police. But before she could plead the call, she was beaten in the head with a phone and shot nine times. Smith and Casey then stole the guns and other items. Howell's boyfriend came home and found her dead body. Smith and Casey quickly became suspects when people reported they were trying to sell guns. Their motel room was searched and some stolen items were found. They were arrested shortly after the murder. Smith agreed to testify against Casey at his trial in 1991. For her testimony, she was given a 10-year sentence. Casey was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. Carla Smith was paroled in 1999 after serving about 8 years. Gerald Casey was executed at age 47 on April 18, 2002, about 20 years before his DNA was linked to Lisa's murder. Casey was an iron worker with a criminal record. 
He had convictions for burglary, possession of marijuana, possession of heroin, theft, and assault on a police officer. At the time of Lisa's murder, he was 24 years old. He had never been considered a suspect in her murder. The cold case investigators got a hold of a blood sample taken from Casey in 1989. A DNA profile was built from that blood sample. It was an exact match to the DNA left on Lisa's clothes. In 2022, 43 years after the murder, the police announced that Lisa Jackson's case was finally closed. The police said that they are investigating some of the other dozen unsolved murders connected to the Texas killing fields. So hopefully next time we do a video about updates of cases, we'll be able to tell you about other cases that were solved. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.